Two weeks ago, Alberta Premier Danielle Smith put a seven-month moratorium on the development of wind and solar projects. And there were approximately $25 billion worth of projects that were in the interconnection queue that were being developed. And so you can only imagine how the uh, criticism and the outrage uh, in Alberta and many parts of it over this move. And during that time, we many analysts, including energy media, have tried to look at, you know, take apart her reasoning, look for evidence, you know, is there uh, analysis that backs up her point of view, her, her reasoning, and we haven't found it yet. So when you can't find evidence or data or, you know, expert opinion, then look for the usual suspect, which is politics. So I'm going to talk to Dwayne Brott, who is a professor of political science at Mount Royal University, about what might be the politics behind this move. So welcome to the interview, Dwayne. Hey, happy to be here, Markham. Well, this is going to be an entertaining conversation because, uh, in a nutshell, uh, her own system operator, the Alberta Electricity System Operator, sorry, not hers, but the province's system operator, has already released a report two years ago saying that what the Premier claims can't be done, in fact, can be done and provides three pathways to achieve it. So if it's not engineering or whatever, and, and we know there's some politics behind this, so what are the politics driving her decision? You know, it was Corey Hogan uh, on The Strategist who said that in re retrospect, this was not an out of the blue announcement that there had been breadcrumbs that had been laid out paving the way for this. And most notably, a March of 2023 appearance that Daniel Smith had to the rural municipalities, where she went into great detail criticizing wind and solar and said, quite frankly, Alberta is a natural gas province. And I think that was a, a sign. Then the video came out of her, of the executive director of the premier's office, Rob Anderson, her closest advisor. This would have been fall of 2021. Again, vehemently attacking wind and solar. Um, you look at who surrounds uh, Smith. It is the same crew from the Wild Roads Party from a decade ago. So Rob Anderson, um, uh, Bruce McAllister, who was the moderator of that video with Anderson and is now running the McDougal Center, the Southern um, Alberta Premier's office, and Dave Yeager. Dave Yeager used to be president of the uh, Wild Rose Party. He now has delivered this secret report on the future of, of energy. So why is that significant? You go back to the 2012 election. And we hear a lot that it was the Lake of Fire that cost Smith the election. And without a doubt, Lake of Fire mattered. But there was also an appearance on the Calgary Herald debate a week before where Smith put a lot of suggestions that climate change wasn't real. The science wasn't unsettled. Uh, and so I think there's still a belief there. They won't say it publicly. They're, they're smart enough not to say it. But I think at their very core, Daniel Smith, Rob Anderson, Dave Yeager, Bruce McAllister, many of the other people in the UCP caucus, not all of them, but the influential ones, don't believe climate change exists. Well, one of the things that I've noticed is that uh, Danielle Smith and her advisors never talk about the climate change. Those words never escape her lips. She talks about emissions yeah. reduction. And there's right. an emissions reduction and energy development plan that got released before the, the election uh, that doesn't talk about climate change. It, it, and the, the implication is that, that the reason emissions have to be reduced is because of federal policy, not science, not changes in the climate. Federal policies, but also um, investors, insurance companies, um, you know, international market forces are calling for emissions reduction, not emissions reduction to address climate change. Yes. No. Is that how how deeply is that embedded in rural Alberta? And 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 we can't talk about rural Alberta and the United Conservative Party without talking about Take Back Alberta and David Parker, its leader. So how because I've seen Parker on on Twitter already, uh, you know, 
bad mouthing uh, renewables and supporting the premier. So are, is this all yeah. part of the same mix? Oh, I think so. There's a, a phrase that emerged in psychology that has been adopted in policy studies uh, called motivated reasoning, and that you can make yourself believe something and argue on behalf of that based on your own individual self-interest. And that individual self-interest is frequently money. So people that work in the oil industry or who, you know, you may just own a corner store in a small town that's dependent on oil and gas. So there's that financial aspect. But I think it's more than that. Uh, I think there is an identity that Albertans have with the oil and gas sector that is different than, let's say, the identity of Quebecers and the aluminum sector or those in BC in the forestry sector or Ontario and uh, the auto sector. It's probably closest to the fisheries in Atlantic Canada, you know, about the self-identification that goes well beyond, um, you know, just the financial aspect. Right. And we've seen, uh, I have an interview with Dr. Jared Wesley on uh, the Energy Talks podcast about this very thing. Janet Brown, the very well-respected pollster in Calgary, has done a lot of work on this. She says uh, uh, more than 50% of Albertans are oil and gas. That's how deeply they are identified with it. And any attack on oil and gas is an attack on them. Yes, exactly. And, and I think that's at play here. And that's where we get to the aspect of renewables. I mean, in a sense, renewable energy is an attack on oil and gas to replace oil and gas with wind and solar. Uh, I don't think it's as simple as that, uh, but that's how it's viewed. So they view wind and solar as the enemy, the enemy technology. You know, it'd be as if the buggy whip people were attacking cars because they see that as the, the competitor and the future. Well, let me, you know, they're not wrong in, in a sense, because the, the two sectors that are generally talked about when we're talk, discussing emissions reductions, which are power sector, transportation, uh, industry, and buildings, two of those uh, are well along the, the S-curve in the energy transition, power and transportation. So you, yeah. you, you install wind and solar to generate clean electricity, and then the, your prime mover that replaces the internal combustion engine is the electric motor. So yeah. they're, they're really actually, in a way, not wrong. But here's what I want to ask you. Well, where that, where, is, is, where that is different is that there's other challenges to um, oil and gas in other jurisdictions, hydroelectric, in Quebec and Manitoba and BC, but not in Alberta, and nuclear energy in Ontario and, and New Brunswick. But because hydro can't be developed in Alberta any more than it already is, we remove that from the table. And I'll get into a whole section about why some of the people who are most anti-solar uh, and wind are actually pro-nuclear. I'm not sure they're actually pro-nuclear as much as they are using nuclear as a stick to beat up environmentalists with. But that's a separate conversation. Well, you know what? It, it's related to my next question, actually, because I yeah. wrote in a column today that what Smith is actually doing is uh, she in Alberta, the oil and gas companies and to some extent the utilities have, but really oil and gas have an incumbent's dilemma. So their, their markets, their industry is being disrupted by new technologies. They don't have an obvious pivot. Like if you look at the auto industry, uh, they do have an obvious pivot. They can go from internal combustion engines to electric cars. They're not the yeah. same thing, but they're cars and trucks. They know that business. So yeah. what is an oil and gas industry? What is an oil? What is Suncor, Synovus, uh, Imperial Oil? What do they pivot to? There's no obvious pivot. So the only thing they can do is retrench, cut costs, try to be competitive, and, and you know do what Blockbuster and Kodak uh, did, which led to their ultimate failure. And my hypothesis, my argument here, Dwayne, is that what she's doing is she's using the power of the provincial government to throw up a shield to protect those incumbents. I don't know. What do you think? I, I think there's a lot to be said for that. Um, and again, I'll go back to the Wild Rose roots. Who were the donors for the Wild Rose Party? They weren't the big companies. They weren't Suncor. They weren't CNRL. They weren't Shell. 
those companies always gave money to the PCs because the PCs were the, the, the party of government. It was the junior operators, the mid-size operators. That's where the donors are. So now you look at the oil and gas sector today. You've got the Pathways Alliance, which is a global conglomerate, the Alberta base, but they operate around the world. They know what is coming uh, and they are trying to prepare for it. And we can say, well, whether they're moving fast enough or in the right direction, they do have a sense of what's happening. But the midsize um, and juniors, they don't operate that way. And therefore, this is a this is a defensive mechanism. You know, they're not looking for 2050. <laughs> they're looking to get through the next five years, the next 10 years. The future will take care of itself. We need defensive action now. Um, and this is just a slight segue about this defensive mechanism, because in 2016, the NDP brought in a, a coal phase out policy. And there's been some discussion recently about that coal phase out. They were gonna get rid of coal by 2030. It accelerated under the Kenny government. And there hasn't been as much blowback about that because what did they largely replace coal with? Natural gas. Now, yes, there was an expansion of wind and solar, but most of the addition was natural gas. Where does natural gas come from? Alberta. You look back at the situation in 2016, 17, even today, because of the shale revolution in the United States, we were not selling the natural gas. There was a surplus of gas. So moving from coal to gas, that was easy for us to do because it was domestic, it was at home. There are still people attacking that, but they're attacking it simply to put the boots to the NDP. Um, not about replacing coal with natural gas. Once you start talking... Talk yeah. Uh, well, I want to talk a little bit more about this defensive mechanism, because can we think of other examples in, in Alberta history or maybe in other provincial, the history of other provinces where the, the a government has been used so baldly to protect economic interests, to protect a particular sector of the economy? Probably the closest analogy, and it's not perfect, would be Newfoundland and the Canadian government and the cod fishery. The scientists knew that they were running out of cotton and they refused to take action on it until it was literally too late. And that's when the big moratorium kicked in. Um, it could have been done a decade before in a much more sustainable fisheries, but no government wanted to do that. So it wasn't sort of a defensive mechanism per se as just ignoring the science because of the political and economic reality. And in the end, what happened? They had to take even more drastic measures. So I would say that that's, that's a pretty close analogy. So if we use that analogy then, and knowing that the decade after they knew there was a problem, that there was a collapse of the fisheries and that created a, a crisis in, in Newfoundland, I mean, I've argued in, in columns, in fact, many of them, that Alberta is staring down the barrel of a similar kind of existential crisis, uh, probably not in that same time frame. I don't think we're going, you know, Alberta is going to be no. in trouble in 2033, but in 2043, it certainly could be. In 2038, it could, certainly could be, uh, depending on how the energy transition goes. And we don't know what the future is. It could go quicker, it could go slower, don't know. But clearly, this is an exist existential threat. It's shocking to me how few people in Alberta talk about it that way. Well, and just this moratorium on wind and solar, which is being described as a six-month pause. It's really a, a seven-month pause, but six months, seven months. It's more than that because it's a signal. They are signaling to very large developers, you are not welcome here. All right. That is rep that is a long term reputational damage, because even though they're not using the language of climate change uh, by attacking wind and solar, and there's no other way of saying it. It's a direct attack on it that will have a long term reputational damage well beyond seven months. Even if this moratorium lifts in February, would you risk millions, hundreds of millions, billions of dollars to invest in Alberta? thinking they could do it again six weeks from now, six months from now. And think about the reputational damage that this may indeed cause Alberta. It's, it's too early to tell, 
but this could have long-term economic ramifications that we're not thinking through because we're so fixated on the now. Will this issue uh, play into uh, Take Back Alberta's stated ambition to basically take over the United Conservative Party. They've, they've got half of the seats now on the on the provincial board. Uh, I think Parker is on the record as saying that they're going to try to get all of them in the, in the very near future. Uh, is this one of those sticks that they can beat up the they don't, with? They don't need all of the seats. I think they want all the seats. They need one more. They need two more, right? They've got half of them, half of them right now. Look at what has occurred since the May election. Uh, this is, in many respects, a return to Daniel Smith's leadership race. Um, you know, the summer, last summer, these are the things that she was talking about. Um, things got awful quiet about this in the month of April and the month of May as we were going into election. Once the election was over, the, the return of the Canadian pension plan, uh, the attacks on wind and solar, the attacks on the federal government. Um, it was like we went quiet. And I think this was a deliberate political strategy to go quiet during the election. Uh, but now uh, it's returned. And look at where the party is. They have zero seats in the city of Edmonton. They have 12 in Calgary, which is a minority. They're in office because they won 37 out of 41 seats outside of the major cities. That is their base of support. That's who they're appealing to. That's why they're saying it was rural municipalities that wanted action on this. Uh, it was land, rural landowners who wanted action on this. Those uppity elites in the cities, they don't understand this land issue. Given that landowners have to give permission for wind and solar, which is not the case with oil and gas development on their land because of surface rights versus subsurface rights. I don't think this is about landowners as about neighbors. It's neighbors who don't like the windmills on their neighbor's property, or they don't like the um, solar panels on their neighbor's property. If this is about prime agricultural land, that's not what's being done here. There is a reason that this massive solar farm was able to go into Vulcan, right? Um, so this is a, a, a class. This is NIMBYism. Let's wrap up our conversation with a discussion of what this will do to federal provincial politics. I mean, you know, Smith, <laughs> the UCP, uh, even under Kenny, they were, you know, forever picking fights with the federal government. Uh, Smith, I didn't think it was possible, but has actually amped up uh, that the rhetoric anyway, uh, and some of and, and the silliness of some of the rhetoric. At what point? If any, does the federal government say, "Look, we've had enough. I mean, we're we're done. We're not going to get any more more than one or two seats in in Alberta anyway." And it it benefits us politically to have a fight with Alberta uh, because we'll maybe pick up seats in BC or Ontario or or Quebec. Uh, what's your take? The two most significant provinces in this country when it comes to federal provincial relations are Quebec and Alberta for very different reasons. They share some similarities about uh, demands for greater provincial autonomy. But if the federal government adopts that strategy that you're describing, they have a real danger of inflaming separatist attitudes in Alberta. And there are separatists that support the UCP and quasi-separatists that support the UCP. I mean, Rob Anderson was the architect of the Free Alberta Strategy, which came into the Sovereignty Act. The Sovereignty Act is actually a bit watered down from what Rob Anderson initially wrote. So that is a danger for the federal government. And um, what is different now compared to, you know, separatist elements back in the early 1980s around the National Energy Pro uh, Program is that Alberta is a much bigger province. Uh, population-wise, as a percentage of Canada's population, um, as an economic driver in Canada, I don't think we want to go down that that road. So I think there's some danger on the on the federal government side, as much as what is occurring on the provincial side. Well, Dwayne, thank you very much for these insights. Really appreciate it. You're welcome.